Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about the hydraulic system of the 737. We're going to go through what we do with it in the cockpit, what the indications are, what the components are, and what happens if we lose the hydraulics. Stay tuned. Wind 31016, Berlin Rex, this video is brought to you together with Blinkist. Now, have you ever found yourself wanting to read so many great books, but don't really have the time to do so? Well, I definitely have, and I love podcasts. And right now I'm using the Blinkist app to listen to a book called The Things You Can Only See When You Slow Down. Now, what's so fantastic with this app is that they have more than 3000 of our best non-fictional books in its library. And they've sat down and they've distilled those books down to the most important bits, which they call blinks. So this means that you can listen to a book that would take you days to read through in only maybe five, 15 minutes, which is great. You know, you get the best out of it. And if you want to try this out, you can use this link here below, which is blinkist.com slash mentorpilot. You can use the app and try it out for free for one week. And if you decide to sign up for it, you get a further 25% discount. So check it out. All right, guys. So the hydraulic system of the 737 is a fascinating system, right? It has a lot of different components to it. And what you can expect from this video is an overview of the system. But first of all, you have to understand why we have a hydraulic system in the first place. So um, on a smaller aircraft, let's say a Cessna, for example, um, there's really no need for complicated hydraulic systems because you can connect the flight control surfaces with wires to the yoke or to the pedals. The only real place where you'll find a hydraulic system on these smaller aircraft tends to be to either if they have an extendable or retractable gear or to the brake system. But as you start getting into bigger aircraft that have bigger rudder surfaces and also flies at higher speeds, there start to be a lot of forces put on those surfaces, uh, which means that you need to have some kind of help to move them. There are different ways of doing this. However, the hydraulic system has a very unique way of being able to create the force needed in one place and exert it in a different place without using bulky equipment where you actually need to exert the force. So for example, um, we use all of the hydraulic pumps are either in the engines or inside of the central wheel well bay, but the actuators for, for example, the uh, ailerons or for the rudder is where they are, right? It's out on the wings or back in the tail. And you can exert a lot of force through the hydraulic system component and very versatile. It's easy to draw and to pull a uh, hydraulic line out to where it needs to be used. So this is why we use hydraulics. However, a hydraulic system is not infallible, right? You can have leaks to the system. You can have pumps not working. So you also have to have, like with every other system on board an aircraft, redundancy. It means that you need to have several different systems that can take up the slack if needed. And that's what we have. So if we look at the components, um, you have essentially three different main components of the hydraulic system. You have hydraulic system A, hydraulic system B, and the standby hydraulic system. Okay? The way that we monitor the system in the cockpit is uh, we have on the lower display unit, the one that's below the main engine components, you can press a button called MFD, the multifunctional display press systems, that will bring up a, an overview of the hydraulic system. It's very simple. You'll get the system pressure and the system, basically the fluid volume. Okay. The normal pressure that we operate on is 3000 PSI. The minimum is 2800 and the maximum is 3500 PSI. All right. So as long as we have good quantity, which is on a one to hundred scale, um, Generally, the, the amount tends to vary depending on how much we're actually using the system. 
because if we for example have uh, the flaps extended then there's going to be a lot of fluid from the hydraulic system B out to actually activate the, the flaps. The, um, the system quantity will then go down but generally it's above 76 percent. If it's below 76 we're going to get a refill warning. Okay, but that warning is only available when we are with normal, um, but everything retracted and we are on the ground, right? So it's not, it's not even armed if you're out flying. Okay, on the overhead panel, we then have the hydraulic panel, which is basically four different switches and a couple of lights. Okay, the switches are for each hydraulic pump. So the hydraulic A system has a engine driven pump which is driven by the number one engine and a electric motor driven pump which is situated in the main wheel well bay. The uh, system B has the same so number two engine driven pump and an electric motor driven pump in the wheel well bay. So these are the switches basically and during normal circumstances the engine driven pump switches are always on so they always operate when the engines are running and the electric switches they are off if the aircraft is being shut down for the night for example during turnarounds we just leave the entire system on okay the lights that you have are um, low pressure for each pump so if the system feels that the pump is not giving enough pressure you get a low pressure and then for the electric driven pumps you also have an overheat warning which indicates that it system the pump is about to overheat because it's being cooled by the hydraulic fluid and if for example there is a loss of hydraulic fluid and there's nothing going through the pump it can both lose pressure and overheat quickly and we then need to switch off the pumps right cool um, so let's have a look at the different hydraulic systems then like I mentioned before uh, system A is driven by the number one engine the one on the left hand side if you see in the direction of the aircraft uh, and the uh, electric motor driven pump there is a difference between these two pumps they give the same output pressure so 3000 psi however the uh, the engine driven pump gives about four times the fluid volume and this is important to know because if you have let's say an engine failure so you lose your engine driven pump it means that the system will still operate, but all of the different components might operate at a slightly slower rate, all right? Especially the components that needs a lot of, of fluid. The uh, flight controls will not be affected, by the way, because they are supported by the opposite system as well, okay? So, system A. Um, if you look at the schematics of system A, you'll see that the top part is the um, hydraulic reservoir. This is where most of the hydraulic fluid is being kept. The reservoir is being pressurized by pneumatic air pressure. That comes from either the APU, if it's running, or the engines. And it's mainly important when we're up at cruising altitude to make sure that the lower pressure up there doesn't make the um, pumps cavitate you need to have a certain pressure on the reservoir now if you look at the uh, schematics you'll see that in the system a reservoir there's a standpipe and that standpipe is connected to the engine driven pump the reason for this is that if you have a failure of the pump a leak in the engine driven pump well then the hydraulic fluid will be going out will be disappearing but only down to the standpipe level and below the standpipe level the fluid taken to the electric motor driven pump is still available. So this means that if you have a leak in the engine driven pump on the left hand side the hydraulic A system is still available through the electric driven pump. And then you'll see that there is a, um, a hydraulic line going to something called the PTU, the power transfer unit. That's because system A fluid is being used to drive a motor that pressurizes the system B fluid in case you need to use the power transfer unit. The power transfer unit is really only there to provide extra volume to, to drive the leading edge devices and the standby, um, the leading edge devices in case they're needed, for example, for auto slat extension in case of a low speed scenario, something like that. So it's a, it's a kind of a backup to, to, to make sure that the amount of fluid in the hydraulic B system 
is available even if you would have for example an engine failure of engine number two All right and then as you can see uh, the hydraulic A system is being connected to all of the flight control surfaces, so the ailerons, the elevators, and the rudder, but also two of the flight spoilers on each wing and the ground spoilers. Okay, you it's connected to the autopilot A. So if you have a loss of hydraulic system A, the autopilot A will not be available. Output B will be, and also the extension and retraction of the landing gear system. Right now, as you can see from the schematics here, um, there is no other connection to the landing gear extension or retraction, which means that if you lose system A for whatever reason, well, then you need to have a separate standby system to extend the gear, and we do. We use the uh, alternate extension system, which essentially is just using gravity to let the gear fall out by themselves. There is a specific checklist for that, and it entails basically just opening the up locks. I have done a separate video for that. If you haven't checked it, I have a cockpit video for how you do that and how we do the entire checklist, which you can check out up here. All right, it's really good. Then, if you go over to hydraulic system B, you'll see that in the system B reservoir, there's also a standpipe, but this standpipe is feeding both the engine driven pump and the electric motor driven pump. So this means that if you have a leak in any of the pumps for the system B, the uh, fluid level will drop down to the standpipe and you lose system B completely. But below the standpipe, you have the PTU, Right? So the power transfer unit will still have volume for system B, even if that happens, to drive the auto slats. Right? Then if you go down, you'll see that the system B is backing up the, uh, uh, the ailerons, the elevators, the uh, rudder as well. But in system B, you have the trailing edge devices as well. So the trailing edge devices, if you lose system B, will not have system A pressure to get them out. So we have an alternate extension procedure for that using an electric motor to drive the screws that will extend the uh, trailing edge devices. However, it is much slower and it doesn't have the same skew protections and protections in general as a normal system does. So you have to be very careful if you use the alternate uh, trailing edge flap extension procedure. Okay, then it's also connected to uh, two of the flight spoilers on each wing and to the uh, autopilot B, of course. Um, but it's also being used for the landing gear transfer unit. So this is a, a similar situation to the power transfer unit, but it's different in the way that the way that the system B is being used is it, it actually um, gives extra volume. If you need to get the gear up, and you get an engine failure of the takeoff on engine number one, for example. Remember I told you that the uh, um, engine driven pumps gives four times the volume from the electric one? Well, we understand that if you have an engine failure on engine number one, you want to get the gear up, you want to reduce the drag as quickly as possible as part of a, uh, an engine failure of the takeoff scenario, well then you need to get the gear up fairly expeditiously. And in this case, the landing gear transfer unit jumps in and it gives the additional volume to get the gear up as quickly as possible, to reduce the drag and to get the aircraft climbing away. So it's a very, very smart system, okay? And then you have the standby system. Now the standby system works to kind of pick up the slack from, for example, the thrust reverses. So if you have a failure of system A, well then the normal thrust reverses are not activated, but the standby thrust reverses are, albeit at a very slow rate. So you might get one thrust reverses opening up quickly, the other one slower using the standby system. So that might give you a bit of a yaw of the landing. So you need to be aware of that. It also activates uh, the leading edge extension the, um, in case of loss of system B. Uh, it drives the rudder in case of complete loss of hydraulic system, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, and the standby yaw damper also in case of a complete loss of hydraulic system. All right, so it's a, it's a smaller system, but, um, but it comes in and kind of picks up the slack where it's needed. All right. 
So what about failures then? Well, we've kind of touched on it a little bit already, uh, but I just want to highlight a few things. If you have a, a leak in a system component in either of the systems that is downstream of the pumps, you are likely going to lose that hydraulic system. But as I've indicated already, it's not that big of a deal because all of the really important uh, functions are being picked up by the other system, like for example, how to control the aircraft, or by the standby hydraulic system. There are, however, some things that will not be taken up. For example, there is no uh, additional uh, hydraulic source that will drive the autopilot. So if you lose system A or system B, that autopilot channel will not be available for you. And that will be important if you want to try to do an autoland. Because remember, you need two autopilots to do an autoland uh, and that will not be available to you. So that will be important from a planning point of view. And then you have specific parts of the system that will not be activated hydraulically. So in the case of a loss of system A, for example, you'll be able to continue to fly the aircraft perfectly. You just use autopilot um, B instead. But then as you, or oh, the pilot monitoring reads through and executes the um, curate checklist, there are some things that will be highlighted. For example, you need to plan for a manual gear extension. And the reason they say plan for it is because it takes a while to do. It doesn't take long, but it makes, takes maybe 30 seconds. While normally just lowering the landing gear is something we will do maybe at four nautical miles. It just takes a second to do. Here it maybe takes 30 seconds to read through. So you might want to plan to do it a little bit further out. And also, since you're now using the kind of gravi gravity to extend the gear, there is no hydraulic system to actually take the gear back up in case you need to. So this means if you do a go around, the gear will be hanging out, you'll be climbing slower. And also if you do a go around because of poor weather and you want to divert, you will not be able to get the gear up during the diversion, which means you're going to use a lot more fuel. So this is something that you will have to plan for as well. Maybe choose to go to a destination which has good weather that can, you know, assure a landing. Or if it has really marginal weather, maybe think about doing a diversion. Also, on top of that, um, you have to input into the OPT, our performance tool, that you have a loss of system A because things, for example, like the ground spoilers are not activated anymore. So you'll have a longer landing distance, All right? The same goes if you lose system B. You you're losing certain components. Most of them are being picked up by system A, but the trailing edge um, flaps are not. Okay, and neither are the la leading edges, which are now being run by the standby system. Um, and the trailing edges, will, you'll have to drive them out using an electric motor, which you'll actually have to hold down to make sure that the trailing edges comes out. And you basically just let it go when you have the trailing edge you want. And as the trailing edges comes out, the leading edges will be automatically extended, depending on what flaps you're using, but you will not be able to retract them. Right? The standby system is only extending the leading edges, it will not retract them. So once again, you're going to have to think about that in case of potential diversion from a fuel burn point of view. Okay? This will also take time, so maybe give yourself a slightly longer final, slow things down a little bit, monitor the trailing edges very carefully to make sure that there's no skew or anything happening during the extension. But all in all, not a big deal either. All right? Now, the real problem comes if you find yourself in the very unlikely scenario of a loss of both system A and B. Now, there is a checklist for this as well. Uh, it's called manual reversion. And the reason it's called manual reversion is because you are now going to have to go in to actually handle the 737 using muscle power. Remember how I talked about the Cessna before and how you use wires that are connected to the yoke and to the uh, rudder pedals in order to drive the flight controls? Well, essentially, if you lose both system A and B, you're turning the uh, Boeing 737 into a big Cessna. The 737 is one of the only aircraft of this size left that actually have physical wires connected out to all of the flight controls. So if you lose system A and B, the rudder will still have some hydraulic help from the standby system. You will still have a standby yaw damper that will work, but ailerons, elevator, 
that's all white muscle power. So you need to be careful. You need to plan this really, really carefully, guys, because you don't want to go into normal, maybe 30 degrees bank. That's going to be way too much. It's going to take you way too much muscle power to get it back level. So plan for maybe 10, 15 degrees of bank, which will give you much bigger turning radius. So in this case, plan for a really long final, All right? It's going to be a, a struggle to do this. Um, you can think about things, for example, about changing roles so that if you have a long way to fly to your destination, maybe you can choose the pilot flying for 10 minutes and then as you're starting to kind of wane with muscle power, switch over so that the pilot flying can rest and make sure that you have someone who's well rested to actually fly the approach procedure in itself, right? It'll be perfectly controllable. I want to really emphasize this, like the 737 is possible to fly with these wires. It's not like an Airbus that requires a um, ram air turbine, a rat to be extended in order to, to, to get hydraulics back. It can be flown like this, but it is a bit of a struggle. And remember, once you get down on the ground and you land this thing as well, now you don't have any flight spoilers, you don't have any ground spoilers. Um, so the landing distance will be longer and also crucially you don't have neither normal nor alternate brakes okay so the brakes that you'll get you'll get from what's left in the brake accumulator which has some pressure in it it always saves a certain amount of, of pressure so that you can get some braking right but this brake pressure accumulator it only has so much pressure so you cannot be pumping the brakes if you do you'll be running out of that you know pressure that's left and you might find yourself without any brakes whatsoever so once you land one steady application of brakes until the aircraft is completely stopped once you are stopped remember you don't have any nose wheel steering you will not be able to taxi the aircraft so it's just about hoping that you have enough brake pressure in the accumulator to set the parking brake and then just wait for uh, for a tow to call and, and tow you to your final destination. All right? So basically that's it guys. Like um, this is the hydraulic system. It's a very, very good redundant system with a lot of backups in it. And even if you fail completely, um, you will still be able to fly the 737. It's a great aircraft from, from that perspective, okay? Now, I'm guessing that you probably have a lot of questions about this. As always, you know, put them in as uh, comments below. I'll try to answer them there. But if you want to talk to me directly or to other operational pilots, either on Airbus, Boeing, or on a private jet, or whatever it might be, we have a lot of them available inside of the chat of the Mentor Aviation app. So once again, this app is completely free to download. You have the links to download it down here. Check it out. Just tag at Mentor if you want to send me a message. And that's it. I want to send a huge thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is Blinkist. It is a really, really good app, which I use myself a lot. And if you want to try it out, then just use this link here below. You'll get one week where you can try it absolutely for free. And then if you like it, you get a further 25% discount by using this link on the price of it. Okay. So so check it out. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. All right, guys. I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.